Hungry Trilobite Podcast would like to start by acknowledging these fine conventions. SoonerCon is Central Oklahoma's longest-running pop culture convention. The next event is scheduled for June 24th through 26, 2002 in Norman, Oklahoma. However, they need your help to put on the next event. Please visit SoonerCon.com to find out how you can help make SoonerCon 30 a reality. The Hellmouth Convention The Hellmouth Convention is a celebration of all pop culture, but specifically things like Buffy, Angel, Firefly, and Dr. Horrible. It is held in Los Angeles, California, and the next event is scheduled for June 3rd through 5th, 2022. Proceeds benefit the Los Angeles LGBT Center as well as the Ron Glass Memorial Scholarship Fund. For more information, go to thehellmouth.org. On tap today, we have Larry Nemechek. How are you doing today? Good, sir. I am doing fine, Aaron. It's good to talk to you. Glad to have you here. Uh, to say that you have street cred in the Star Trek community is a bit of an understatement. <laughs> we were just talking offline about where we met, and you're the kind of person that you, you bump up in all sorts of places, not the least of which being various conventions, various panels, writing for Star Trek.com and uh, Star Trek magazine. So you are one of the people that the Trek community has as a treasure trove. Oh, okay. I don't know about <laughs> I don't know about treasure trove, but anyway, I just I just try to uh, get the new recorded and make sure the old recorded is not forgotten. That and sense? that's important yeah. because yeah. we have generations of fans now who are discovering the show in the digital age only for the first time. Yeah. Who probably would appreciate what's gone on in, in years prior, but just have no access to it. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's awesome that we do. I, I, one of the things I think I, I've gotten good at also is reminding the folks who have known me for a while that things aren't static, that things creep up. Like, for instance, we just had the um, all the trailers for the new animation for the new season of Lower Decks, but also the first look at Prodigy. But the new the new Lower Decks season had the big Tom Paris commemorative plate joke in it. Right. And and that flew by. We were I, a lot of us were laughing about it, and then doubly so that they're going to sell that plate, which is awesome. But you had a whole generation of younger fans going, "A plate? That's hysterical!" And everybody going, "Yeah, that's we used to have collectors' plates, but we had. I mean, collectors' plates was a thing beyond Star Trek. It's mm -hmm. just, my grandma had her. Whenever we went on a vacation, we brought her back a souvenir plate from where we mm -hmm. went. But it's just it's fun to watch not only that being a great joke. And then the great joke of them selling the plate. But then we have a, a fourth of fandom that had no idea, you know, Star Trek plates were a thing, much less, mm -hmm. you know, plates were a thing. So it's it's one of those little things that kind of remind you, because it was fun to look in threads and see people kind of, you know, virtually looking around going, yeah, it's funny, but it's just a plate. <laughs> and people going, but it's a plate. And you're going, yeah, <laughs> didn't you ever have one for the, for, you know, from the Poconos or from Death Valley? Didn't you ever have a plate? You know, but they didn't because believe me, plates have been like dead for 20 years as a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an old ladies thing, but now it's going to be a hot new kid thing. So it's hysterical. I but feel that's a perfect tell. example of what I'm talking about. Yeah. I'm going to have to add to the show notes, like a link to a YouTube video of the, the collector's plate ad. They were classic because each one would always use the same verbiage. Like there's no guarantee they'll go up in value but all the others have, meaning you're a flipping moron if you don't buy this mm -hmm. thing because it's your ticket to early retirement. And but of if, course, you, yeah. But if anybody bought those because they thought they were going to be an investment, I mean, real, they would say like, oh, it's rimmed in two carat gold gold here on the, you know, but no, it was, it was, there'd always been plates, but there was a big, you know, a 90 sticky thing of all the, you know, the recipe card boxes and collector plates and the pewter chess sets and not just Star Trek, but everywhere, you know, the infomercial 30 second infomercial thing. And, and Star Trek, you know, the licensing got into that too. And, you know, the, the ceramic busts and the false graph, not just dishes, but the, you know, and the wind up music boxes with a display of a bird of prey and a plasma cloud. I mean, all that kitschy 90s stuff about the time it, falls off the market now it'll be it'll all come back now and be <laughs> it'll be valuable or something i don't know anyway but it's you know it's like the i always talk about the pendulum swinging the pen, people who get all upset about what's going on right now or they get all sentimental or mournful it's like just just hang around 10 years it'll yeah. be you know just just hang in there it'll come back don't and believe me and if you if you are mad because people don't like the thing you like now just 
just hang on. <laughs> It'll come back. It's just, it's just, you know, whether it's the original series or, or any of the other series or whatever, you know. It's it's funny uh, you mentioned the, the pendulum coming back because I, I'm a huge DS9 fan. I mean, I love all <laughs> Trek, but DS9 is kind of my my go to. Mm -hmm. And there's such a love for DS9 now. And I keep telling people that's a recent thing. Mm -hmm. it, when you were a DS9 it's a, it's fan. A, it's a Netflix bingeable, bingeability mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. yeah. If you were a net a, a DS9 fan back in the day, you were like the middle child between Next Gen and Voyager. Mm hmm. Yeah, you were. And, I mean, Ira would say that Ira Barry would say DS9 is the stepchild series. And it was also hard. I mean, the whole pair. It's not just the paradigm of making the shows. And we were starting to figure out these, you know, these. Um, the good points of only being a 10 series or a 10 episode season, right? At the beginning, it was like, oh, my God, they just get started and they're done. But the good side of that is, aside from maybe burnout and burning out on the creators, is um, is that people can follow the platform. Video on demand is one thing, because in the old days, DS9 and Voyager didn't have the fans because they were on increasingly dinkier stations, you know. And it, when it was just a you've got to catch it or you rerun, or you could you could you know tape it, you could VCR it, but that was on you. <laughs> and and um, you know when it would get, but people would talk about the local channel that had the NBA or the, you know, the hockey, the NHL game team, and it would get bumped to two at night, you know, or something. And anyway, it was just hard, especially DS9 now is hardly hardcore. It's not Discovery or Picard serialized, but when they got the Dominion War, but still people felt like all these running characters, like there were 40 characters or whatever, and keeping up with all that was just exhausting in the 90s. And when you couldn't catch every show, you'd have people you know, they'd miss a show or two and go, I give up. I've missed two shows and I can't keep up. And that was that was the paradigm though, right? It was. That's what you were up against. You really, that old that old uh, comic line, but you had to be a tough fan. You know, you had to be a really tough fan to hang in with that. And I knew a lot of people who would watch Next Gen casually, you know, it would be on in reruns when they had dinner or something. And they would say, well, I just can't get into Deep Space Nine. And they, they couldn't get into it because they were watching an episode here and an episode there. And they weren't taking the show mm -hmm. as it was designed to be taken, which was a foreign concept at that point. You, you watched the show when yeah. it was on. You didn't well, plan that, Yeah. And that's why I love it when people today say in this whole new reexamination of DS9, People say, you know, we all love Next Gen, et cetera, et cetera. But um, DS9 is the show that's held up, I'm air quoting, you know, the most because it was a little darker. It got into some of these themes that were really post 9-11, not pre 9-11. But the biggest thing was just the structure and the way they didn't care and they just went for it and nothing had to wrap up. You know, they didn't care that that some syndicated buyer is going to care that he can't show them out of order if he wants to, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, the thing that drove people away in the, in the first run is now what endears it to people more than maybe the other shows. Exactly. And I've often said that, you know, because next gen was trying very hard to be its own thing. And, you know, the original series had to be its own thing because it was the first thing. Right. But right. what DS9 brought to the table for me was it was the first trek that showed what the future was like if you weren't traveling the galaxy, if you weren't an adventurer, if you were just a person trying to make your way in the world, that's that's showed you your life. Yeah, but that's what, you know, the parody, whether it was next gen original series, it was a ship called Enterprise going from planet to planet. Mm -hmm. And that was just almost a bridge too far for a lot of people. It just kind of, you know, broke their head. But yeah, I mean, a lot of us, I, I was fine with that. A lot, I mean, I, I could feel just as a show, just as a format, they were very, I mean, all the Star Treks are a, are a lot of working pieces. There's, you know. And uh, when you get to that well-oiled machine stage, it takes a while. And a lot of people say, well, that's too bad. This is TV and you should be good out of the gate or you should be gone. Nobody gets three years to get good. And of course, no one wants that. And, right. and the stream, that's one thing about the streaming model. Well, <laughs> poor Discovery had a really hard birth. But, but Picard and the animated so far, and I'm betting Strange New World, are going to be way more fully formed feeling than Next Gen certainly did. We were just so desperate for next gen in, in the first run and people watching 
watching these things because they're just a row of, you know, episode avatars on Netflix or something or on Paramount Plus, I should say. Or it's just they've even got their DVD, their blue sets, you know. It's just it's just another episode in the line and that week to week watching and being affected by what was going on in the world is a context that sometimes gets lost and people look at and that's fine. It's like the movies. People watch the motion picture and they love it or they critique it without thinking that that was like that was like a revolution in entertainment because mm-hmm. no, there there never been a dead little show come back to a, this huge movie treatment. That was in, I mean. There was a TV movie made of, you know, Bat- sometimes they would take episodes and Batman had his little TV movie. I mean, they showed it in theaters, but it was really a TV scale movie. Um, and you had two or three cases like that. You know, the Buck Rogers, they did that way. The, the original Battlestar Galactica did it. But nothing had been done like Star Trek before. That was a whole new, you know, that was a whole new thing. And then after that, it was off to the races and and economics and you know politics and all that played a part in it but the first the motion picture was deserves to be judged as a motion picture with all its flaws and strengths but it was it was like a social movement (laughs) and nothing and it had gone where nothing had ever gone before you know fans bringing back a show and demanding it and then even watching it is anything else that was you know off and on and off and on and off and on that would have driven well it drove fans crazy Nothing else would. It's like it's like Discovery. Any other show that comes out of the gate where it's it's the original showrunner is let go nine months in. Right. And it, it's delayed for a year and a half or whatever, you know, whatever the soap opera was around the opening of Discovery and going through three sets of writers rooms or overlapping writers rooms just to get to the first season. And people say, wow, it's very uneven. And wow, it sure changed. from. It's like, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But, you know, that's nothing new. That's nothing relegated to um, motion picture. But again, it was something we have to launch this new service and it's a Star Trek and it's in the spotlight and it cannot fail. Just like the motion picture had to be in those theaters and it could not fail. And that's the blessing and the curse of all Star Treks now. And the, the, the famous story that when the motion picture was running in its initial premiere, they were still bringing the last reel of film to the theaters when the first reel went mm-hmm. in. They were literally on the road with that reel in hand. They it were was... shipping them wet. Mm-hmm. There were water spots on some of the prints they'd show in theaters. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's amazing. Somebody had said to me not too long ago on Twitter that they were just like, well, not to be specific, the top topic was raised. You know, when they were, when Next Gen was out, was there this same theory that it's not real Trek? That it's, of course. It's, yes. Yes. I remember that I called them the loud 10%. I, I used to subscribe to inter- before social media and before anything, you know, instantaneous. Uh, and you were still relying on paper and stamps fandom. But Interstat was like the high end, I don't know, 500 people subscribed to it in the country. But you had these debates going on in the letters and people would like, you know, debate things. And you had about 10 percent of especially the older fans, because it, it's a it's a I keep using that word. It's a paradigm thing. Star Trek meant Kirk, Spock and McCoy, Shatner, Nimoy, Kelly, who I loved. I see, you know, McCoy is still my guy and I love D. Kelly. But it's like, you know, ever since I first saw after I'd seen the second or third rerun of Journey to Babel, I was like, oh. So what's going on back at Federation HQ? <laughs> what's what is a council debate really like all through the movies? I was like, can we please see the other races? Can we please see? It was like a secret. It's like you guys know there's more going on than these people on this one ship. <laughs> you do know that. You know, it's like I want to see all of that. So, you know, I was always bugging around to show the rest of the Federation when what's out there and expand off there. So I was ready for it. And I was, and I remember thinking when it was debuting and I, you'd hear people griping. I'm like, gee, shut up. Gene is running it. This is what you wanted. 20, what? You're going to, you're going to have the guys in their sixties all doing 16 hour TV days. No, that's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, that's not going to happen, but you've got Gene running a show. This is what you wanted people. I, I just did not understand it. And it was creaky out of the box and a little bit, but people were so starved and hungry. And there wasn't a lot of sci-fi out still even to compete with it on a, on a broad level, but yeah. And everybody like hung in with it and was loyal. And i I know the people were out there. Well, I'm not going to watch it and I'm going to, you know, and they called that new Trek in you mm-hmm. Trek. And they, there were all the new Coke 
we were just talking about this the other day. There were all the new Coke and Coke classic things. For a while, people were trying to say new Trek and classic Trek. And then that's when the TOS moniker came up. This is what I said on Tuesday's Live a couple of weeks ago. It's like TOS became a thing when the next generation. It's like nobody. I never heard the term corded phone mm -hmm. until cordless phones not only came out, but then when they got to be dominant. Now it's like the oddball is the corded phone. You know, anyway. It's like none of that that whole three letter debate thing about all the new shows that all started with next because we were all like grappling for what to call it. And I'm like, no, we're not. Nobody wanted to say new Trek and classic Trek because everybody knew what happened to new Coke. Right. <laughs> but what I, we did see and, and just to swing back to DS9 for a minute is yeah, I think yeah. that was one of the best things DS9 did was that, you know, if, you, if we had never had a third show, if it was always the original series and next gen. I think there was a group of people who would have always just said the original is the original. The original is the only one that counts. That's where I'm going to stay. What the third series did was it said, no, we're going to do this. We're going to iterate the story mm -hmm. every couple of years with a new crew, with a new chapter. And you don't have to get on board. You, you, you can decide it's not for you, but this is what Trek is going to do. It's, it's just one of those things that you were going to make this model. And the, the third series said, this is going to happen. Yeah, it was kind of like three points determine a plane or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I was about to in my head, I was thinking, no, two points determine a line, but it's like, no, I need a third. That's yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, and at the time, nobody was thinking. At the time, you know, the network, the the studio, because it wasn't network. The studio just wanted to make more money because Star Trek was hot and Next Gen was at its peak. And and if he says now, and I think he meant it, that you know, Rick was like, let's not let's not tap the well too many times. And again, that was the world of the business model is 26 episode seasons because that's what it was. everything was so expensive to amortize the overhead you had to do that much right and and it, you either had i mean you either had a regular season which was 26 shows or you did you know, like a mini series and you had four or five or six mm -hmm. or you did a theatrical movie but it was like that was about that was like your models you had and it, it's almost like if you'd been a series and you went to a mini series that was almost like a step down or a sign that you know that's a sign that this is the hollywood show signing show equivalent of your career <laughs> like you can't do the big thing anymore but we're going to we're going to give you these you know these bite sized pieces as in the twilight of your career you know show x and and so it was almost like an insult or it was like a way to give that niche audience a little something while not risking you know the overhead cost of a full show so it was like everything was like and but i was always wanting i was wanting a show between uh picard and kirk i was wanting a show i always i've wanted the romulan war founding of the federation for ages and so you know skip ahead a little bit when they announced enterprise and people are like no that's going back star trek is always about going forward that's going backwards and i'm like shut up shut up you know it's like i'm sorry 2151 is still in the future to me but you know i'd heard the writers talk about how hard it was to get writers to to latch on to how specific star trek was because you had these not perfect people but elevated people and you couldn't just go to the tropes of you know tv writing you had to you had to elevate your game a little bit when you had conflict and and pay attention to technology not let it not you know technobabble yourself to death but be aware and, and not lean on technobabble at the same time and and those people that were like no i'm like no shut up i want to see the wrong i want to see the founding of the federation well you know that's a big gap let's do that but there's so we could have a klingon show we could have a romulan show. we could have a cardassian show we could we could have a tellerite show for god's sake we could have all these things and and the great thing about next gen, talk about your three points in space, this, just having a line meant that you had a line, you had a timeline. Mm -hmm. and, and having it be, you know, for those people that were griping about next gen stealing the thunder from the original series, it's like, no, they didn't. It was not a reboot the way we think of it now. It was mm -hmm. not a, you know, a Marvel DC every three years we recast and have new people playing Superman or, or, or Spider Man or something. It was the original people with their faces. And next gen is going to keep them, but just go ahead in time 80. They're still our heroes 80 years in the future. And that history, you know, has evolved to this point. But what all they've done now is get off a page and opened up a book, you know, and then and then, yeah, DS9 and everything after that gave you a library. So we've got all that to play with 
what's wrong with you not exploiting it? That's why even today I'm like, well, let's go back and reboot. And it's like, no, let's not reboot next gen or DS9. Let's, there is so much else to get to for the first time. What is wrong? And, and that's why it's like, oh my God, they fought, you know, Alex Kurtzman fought. Maybe you quibble, maybe they stumble. Maybe you don't like everything they're doing. It's obviously a learning curve the last three or four years because Star Trek is hard, but he gets it about opening up what I'm calling a buffet of Star Trek now, you know, and it's not like, ooh, animation is a radical return. It's like, no, we're going to have young adult animation. We're going to have, you know, adult swim style animation over here and we're going to do more, you know, and if this thing he dropped the other day, I'm sorry, I'm rambling, but if this no, thing no, he dropped the other day about this quirky uh, trouble with Edward <laughs> was not exactly my cup of tea humor wise, but I could, I could deal with that. And of course, you know, I didn't know about Seth MacFarlane's show, you know, Orville. Oh, was it going to be a fart joke every five seconds? No, it was. They started there, but they quickly evolved. So, you know, it's but somebody who gets it that Star Trek can be this whole universe and live up to its potential. And we have to we could maybe even not that it's a race, not that it's a contest. But, you know, I'm so tired of hearing about the Marvel Universe and the Star Wars Universe. It's like Star Trek had them all beat in the beginning and it was all on film. It wasn't trading cards and comic books it was and i know marvel's a comic universe so that's a little non sequitur yeah. but for star wars it's like it's on film <laughs> whether it's a lot of it or you know one little thing you know whether it's cardassians or it's colonel green you know it's like there's tons of of potential there for star trek to play with and it's like finally and and that in the streaming universe which people are like yeah and 10, 10 episodes a year seems like a cheat to me. And then like a year and a half between seasons. I mean, I get it, but that's a business model. That's going to let us tell all these different stories and, and may hopefully maybe not get a burnout like happened when it was DS nine and Voyager actually like splitting the audience or people were just walking away. Okay. I'm going to take a breath. Sorry. No, no, that's, that's quite, you got, so that's, me, you got me running there, but yeah. And I, I'm glad I did. I'm very glad I, I did. just, uh, but you know, the word potential is exactly what I was hoping to hit on and exactly why I know this because you're a fan of the show, presumably from way back at not, not you specifically, but you. And I'm a general. rerun baby. I'm, sure. a re I'm, a, uh, sure. I'm not a, not a first run NBC person. I, I look at those people in awe now, but no, I'm a rerun baby. I, I got into the show with the animated series when I was six years old. I oh. very vaguely remember the world before the next generation. That's a very fuzzy memory for me. But um, if, if somebody is looking at this and saying that they, they want to be into it, like you're, you're literally watching a show about space exploration, about going where no one has gone before. How do you not understand this is a universe, a literal universe of stories to tell? Well, Why and now it's spanning concept? now it's spanning three centuries and mm -hmm. you've opened up. A, and yes, you can go tell alternate. You can go do Mary Universe. Or excuse me. Terran Universe now. You can go do Terran stories. You can do, you can do the universe where you know scraggly beard Riker with the board taking over. But you know you can do all kinds of alternate universe, much less just the prime time of the Kelvin. I guess I should mention Kelvin. But you can do just do the prime universe over three centuries, and there's so many. Like I said, we still don't have a founding of the Federation Romulan War series, much less all these things in between. You know. All the midway between Kirk and Picard. What about that? You know, midway between Archer and Kirk. What about that? I, I, there's just so much you could, you could go to. This is where the books are such a mixed mm -hmm. blessing for me because I will, I will find one that really sinks into a story I want to tell. And it's like, I love this. I want everybody to read it. I'm going to buy a box of these and give them to people for Christmas. And then I realize. But the fact that this book exists means they might never want to put that on the screen. Right. Or at least they might put it in a way that it's, I don't. Yeah. It's slowly changing, but that so much of it was just about rights and money and people doing a movie or a TV show. Do they really want to, unless, unless somebody who wrote the book was part of that team to begin with or quickly mm -hmm. got there, you know, then it's just a thing of, do we really want to give up that much money and residual power to, someone outside the circle it's i mean it which sounds really petty but that's kind of you know the deal now if the market was if they were cranking out 20 20 standalone episodes i mean not standalone 20 um um you know like american horror story where it changes every year the back you know, if they were doing that constantly or like brian fuller's original idea for discovery was going to be every season it was going to be the same actors playing uh 
a different a different situation, a different format, different era of track. Mm-hmm. If if you ever got to that point where you had that, I mean, that's what I'd like the movie series to be. I would love for the movies to actually be in the Star Trek universe, maybe use a character or two, maybe even an actor or two playing a character, but basically be one offs, which now that's, you know, what I was wanting in the 90s was for these series to take on different things. <laughs> like you have to design new costumes and props and sets. So that'll never happen because right. the cost of that, you know, the overhead, the investment's too much. Well, now I'm that way with movies. It's like, okay, fine. Well, then do a different. Well, they'll never do that because the minute they have a hit movie, they'll want to make sequels of it. It's like, oh, let's go with it. You know, so it's almost like you're never going to get that because it's going to be self-fulfillingly not going to happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but that's my dream idea. That's why Short Treks was kind of like a cool compromise. Yes. And and now it feels like maybe they're going to get concentrated on churning out series and not, you know, at the beginning when they were still kind of groping for the best ways to do things and try out new writers and directors and actors and roles and things. It was, it was, an ex- it was like a little lab theater, you know, a little experimental theater, but now the, sh- now the, the oomph is shifting to the series and promoting them. And maybe that goes away. I don't know. I have, it's like, they've been kind of quiet on the future of short treks, but short treks was a great way to get at least, you know, tastes of other things. And they were, if nothing else, you could tell that they were labors of love because they they were just a couple minute segments that told stories that needed to be told or wanted to be told that were the kind of things that fans like you and I sit around and think or about. Or could be, but, just could be told. Yeah, but weren't necessarily worth a, a whole episode, much less a whole series. Yeah, or, or just to see what this looked like. And, you know, granted, they wound up, they had an Uber arc with, with a few of them because they wound up like Poe, the princess, and... Some of those bits they pulled in for Discovery and the one that was used kind of as a mini, almost a mini pilot, not a mini pilot, a, a prequel, a prologue here, like a mini prologue for Picard, right, with the attack on Mars. Um, and But the two animated ones felt like maybe they were experimenting with animation styles, you know, mm-hmm. different ways and tones and things. So or maybe they were really good things they wanted to give a, you know, they wanted to give a chance to air and see where it went. So, yeah, I just the fact that it, whatever the experiment was about or it was like, you know, dubious, the, the whole Calypso episode <laughs> is still hanging out there to see what ha- what becomes of that. But right. Um, the far, 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 far future that is hanging over discovery. But, you know, I you know, that was a that may be the closest we get in the in the current age to having to being able to play with all the different tones that way. But the whole thing about the books is they've they've. You know, Kirsten Byers is in there from Book World. I mean, Gar and Judy came to the last season of Enterprise because the idea was they worked with Shatner and they were going to get him in to do something, say, like the Mirror Universe episode that didn't happen, where it was Tiberius Kirk again. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen, but Gar and Judy were definitely from the Book World coming in. And, you know, Melinda Snodgrass had written Tears the Singers and came early, almost forgotten. If it not for the measure of a man and that being so celebrated, people would almost forget that Melinda was a book writer who came in to, you know, to do uh, scripts and try to make that pivot. And, you know, a few other people have, have done that too, but mostly the book world is seen as this is just icing for you guys in between the main courses. And, um, and they've taken pitches from uh, David Mack started off uh, teaming up with the pocket editor and wrote a couple of, you know, sold a couple of stories and they, they were on them for a certain degree of time. Um, Starship down was one of them. I've forgotten the other one, but uh, you know, it happens, but as far as going big time and full time with it, that really hasn't happened until Kirsten. And, um, and she's now they're, they're making that effort and it'll be as coordinated as it's ever been, but it's still not going to be, it's just impractical. But yeah, the way and, TV has to hurry up and wait now. Yeah, they have to grind. And there's a, a value in being able to say, this is the printed word. There's no special effects. There's no cost except you sitting on your butt at a typewriter. Do whatever you want. Do right. whatever your brain will get away with. We can't not have that in a, in a series about exploration. We well, yeah, are exploring the galaxy where who knows what you're going to run into. You know, species and life forms and, and just sites you know, event, cosmic events happening or whatever. So, so it's, a th- I mean, as much as people would love for that to happen, I mean, look, you, you start a series 
and people write it, somebody writes a book and it's totally innocuous and five years into this, if it's a success, if it's a failure, no one cares. <laughs> so, you know, but you're, you're two or three years in and now somebody wants to attack that problem. But the way that book was, written, even if they wanted to go back and give rights to that author, you know, whatever the, the event, they will never like mock the character kind of thing, but the, the event say, or the situation, Star Trek world canon timeline, if they want to go back to that, the original details of the book have probably all been messed up by now. They've probably all been bypassed or contradicted or whatever. So that it's not, you know, when we pitched a story, um, when Voyager was starting and Janet and I pitched a story that wound up becoming Prophecy, the seventh season, it was a Balana story about the Klingons in the Delta Quadrant, finding Klingons in the Delta Quadrant. You know, we had a blank slate to play with and we pitched this story and that's what they bought. And then for three or four reasons, it kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. And after three or four years, we were like, well, pfft, it's pointless now. The char- you know, they were baby characters then. They've all grown to what we were doing the story around. So they kept the, the premise, which was finding Klingons, the Delta Quadrant, as a generational ship and, and Bolana as the central figure. But everything else had to be changed. And they were kind enough to leave us on as they didn't have to by then, but they left us on screen. So we got a little bit more residual than the original you know, payment for it. But that's a, that's a total example of, you know, they wanted to use our story idea, but the details had changed so much. It was kind of impractical. And by the time you're into a novel situation, a novel is nothing but tons of details. So, yeah. So it's, I mean, like, this is great that they're taking the step and trying to have Kirsten coordinate to note to, and comics also. But even like the, the, the novel lines have had to like, re- they had such a rich job filling in the gap, filling in the fallow years there, mm-hmm. especially with the next gen books that now they've got Picard. Like no one will we'll never see these people again. Just go write your stories, guys and gals. And then, oh, look, we're doing a Picard series. <laughs> so all of a sudden, you know, and, and I, we, I did a poll on Tuesday's Live. It's like, do you expect them to keep up? And STO's gaming. It's 50 years in the future from Nemesis. But half, you know, they're halfway to that with Picard. So it's like, well, are they going to try to follow canon? Because Pocket and STO didn't no. merge. You know, they didn't. They didn't agree. They did on some things broadly, but you know, and they kind of tried to do the Romulus star explosion, whether it was a, you know, all the goofiness around that, and now they've reframed it with Picard. But anyways, but you know, it's like they're already trying to realign some of the book series to get them in in touch with Picard or in an alignment with Picard. Anyway, that's a, that's a, but people need to stop and realize that, well, I wish they just used this book. You know, it's like, well, you know, you knew the job was dangerous when you took it. <laughs> yeah, gonna, that's a great way to put it. If you're going to enjoy that book, cool, go do it. It makes, and occasionally they'll pull something out, you know, or a game manual or something. They'll pull mm-hmm. those things out. But you, it's it's just it's just as long as we don't live like the prophets and as long as we have lineal time <laughs> we're stuck with it anyway i'm sorry I, I got off on another rant on no no please that's that's excellent that's excellent i um these books the games the anything other than what's officially canon it's great to have it i would rather know it than not know it but like you said you know what it was like when you picked it up and you knew that it wasn't going to be subscribed to by the writers and there are things I wish I could put in there. And there, there's those like the, the comics that predated the, the, the JJ movies, um, the prequels for those. To me, the movies oh. don't really make sense unless you read those comics. Right, countdown. Well, that's why uh, what Bob and Alex did them yeah. to make sense of things. You know, they fixed, like, what do you mean it's a, it's a supernova and it's affecting whole sectors of, no, a supernova would go like about the distance maybe the distance to the next star, you know, like sun to Sol to Alpha Centauri is four light years over mm-hmm. 4.3 light years. So yeah, a, a supernova, a nova, much less a supernova is going to affect the planets in its system. If it had some and, you know, adjacent space, but it doesn't go on and on and on. It's not like a tsunami across half the galaxy or something. And that's what they needed for the story to make sense. You know, so it's threatening the Federation planets. It's threatening Vulcan. It's from Romulus? Really? It's not just hitting like the next star over. So they came up with in the comic retcon that it was a 
it was a subspace supernova. And that's why it was so weird that it was dipping in and out of subspace and hopping up. And, you know, you never knew where it was going to pop up. So it was dangerous. And and it was like a shock wave, not just a regular supernova. And so that was all retcon the comic. And that's how we were able to wrap our head. That's what I when I we did the star cartography, the update that became star cartography on charting. Um, was that's how we dealt with it because you especially when you look at a map you go wow that's the biggest known you know supernova ever known to exist and then sto on star trek online made it that it wasn't a natural supernova that it was a it was a terrorist act that it was a you know a triggered explosion mm -hmm. to wipe out x nano systems and they made it basically a terrorist plot that it was a weaponized supernova that was caused triggered but all that has now been, you know, either way, <laughs> the comic and, and and the game have all been. No, it's all been reeled back into just being a regular supernova, you know, that went that Romulus, the Romulan star went off and it just affected the home world. And we never have talked about Remus, but no. OK, but, you know, but that's a perfect example of, oh, OK, but for 10 years, all of licensing world treated it as a subspace shockwave supernova, you know, and then they decide, okay, now we're doing stories again for real on screen because this is a screen franchise and that's what takes the precedent. And it was like, okay, we're going to have to go back and redo all, <laughs> but it's not the first time. It's not the first time. So we fudged things, you know, had to tweak and retcon things before. But And pe that's the thing. People act like this is a shocking thing. It's like, okay, well, either you can have a little thing that you enjoyed for a couple of years and it went away Sorry, Firefly. It's it's it was amazing. <laughs> or you can have a thing that's going to be 55 years old and climbing, mm -hmm. you know, a franchise, a universe. And we're not the again, we're not the prophets. We can't exist, you know, in all time frames and know what to do at all times. So we're and, I mean, human. you talk about being only human and not knowing what to do. At, at some point, we're going to have to just like we were talking about the the next gen TOS flame wars of the late 80s. There's going to be a time when people look back at this moment and say, wow, how did you people manage to be fans without conventions? And how did you manage to just, you know, Twitter your yeah. fan theories back and forth? What do you think is good, this area is going to look like 10, 20 years from now when the fans from that era are looking back on it? Yeah. Well, two things about the opening premise there. Number one, the the people that didn't like Next Gen, I'm going to say where, again, I call them the loud 10%. And here's the thing, the those people are debating in Interstats pages. That was like a little bubble of fandom. What I've always called armchair fandom, they didn't know. I mean, people all had their opinions. You and your two or three buddies you know, in your club or just that hung out together that are, you would see, watch a show and then the next day argue about it or talk about it. You know, you had your world and maybe, and then Starlog came along and some of the other lice, you know, and, or the glorified fanzines came and the official fan club came out and communicator, but you were in touch. And then, you know, oh, now we've got entertainment tonight to carry stories. Okay. And then boom, you've got cable and now boom, you've got the internet and it's off to the races and everybody can know everything all the time. But um, oh, I've lost my train. But anyway, it was about uh, it was about the awareness and feedback and um, oh, th the next gen thing. That was really only like I said the loud ten percent. But to me, that's the way it always felt because the people that I knew, maybe out of six or eight people, you know, firsthand, maybe one would kind of grouse about it. But most people were just happy to have Star Trek back, you know. So it's like when you look at that, and it's the same thing as today. I'm always saying when you get people get angry or they get depressed or they get all riled up about some online thread they're in on a Facebook page or in Twitter or something. God, now they're weaponizing Instagram. The trolls are coming over, whatever. And Instagram was supposed to be the pretty pictures. Um, it's like that's online fandom. Go out to, you know, go to a first of all, go to a convention. You never meet those people at a convention live. No. But a convention is just a slice of fandom. You know, it's like, don't mistake online world for all fandom. Don't mistake even live conventions for the people that are just sitting at home and watching the shows. Now they can watch them on anything. Watching the shows at their beck and call. They buy the books. They buy the action figures, you know, games, the gamers. I mean, there's all these slices, but there's this vast unwashed fandom that doesn't get their panties in a wad over some of this stuff. Or they might notice it and go, huh, 
okay, I was thinking this, you know, now they go in Google or now they go in memory alpha and they, here's all the things they go. Oh, okay. But the, the emotional end of it and people being all tied up in something people, the fallow years were just about everybody having to carry their thoughts and their head cannon with them for 12 years. And then all of a sudden forget what it was like. You know, you didn't carry a thought for a year and then see it updated. You carried it for 12 years and saw it, or maybe longer than that before somebody got around to saying something more about it. So anyway, it's um, what people will say about now. I, I think, you know, like I was doing Portal 47 by Zoom five years ago. It was free conference call, but still before the pandemic hit, I mean, teachers and educators and business people and coaches, I mean, uh, like life coaches, business coaches, that world was using, I mean, it was a radical thing. I had to keep explaining to people when I launched Portal 47, hey, we're gonna, it's like a mini con all year long, no matter where you live, no matter where your center seat is. You know, I come to you and you can be around the world. And, and then we're going to bring people that you never get to hear in a magazine or on stage, even at a live con, because we're going to, you know, it's the actors, we love them, but you hear from them all the time. And the people that really made the shows, you rarely get to hear from. And that's what Portal 47 was. And here's some things out of my library. Now we're digital. I'll just email it to you. And, you know, we had podcasts, but podcasts were even, you know, and then video took, you know, and then YouTubers. But that's only like one thing at a time. And how fast can you crank stuff out? And how many people, you know, there's a perception that, oh, well, no one cares. I mean, when I was first in fandom, after a while, I'd go to a really good Trek con. Starland in Denver was my old go-to favorite that we could drive to from Oklahoma. But you'd hear Frakes. This is my old story about hearing Jonathan on stage or Marina. I, I For some reason, I remember Jonathan, though, saying people would ask the question. He'd be Q&A. And he'd say, you know, and somebody would be, you know, OK, fine. It's an anal cannon question or it's a how did this happen thing. But that's what people want to know. A chunk of fandom want to know. Or why was it written this way, even if it's it's even about shipping? And Jonathan would say, you know what? That's a Michael Pillar question. You know what? That's a Herman Zimmerman question. Or you know what? That's a Michael Westmore question or a Dan Curry question or a Bob Blackman question. And I'm going, why aren't they on stage then? Thank you. You know, you know. Thanks. So anyway, that's that's been my life. But this technology we have now, that's what that's what let me. So in the future, I think they're going to look back and go, oh, the pandemic was the big swivel. And we'll never give up live events. No. But throughout all of culture it we're this way now but i think the best of what streaming is will hang on and people will just go back and go oh just like now we go back and go netflix that's when people caught on to ds9 excellent point and, and i'm gonna give a little i'm gonna drop a little inside baseball on you now which is obvious to anybody watching this or listening to it but you don't know this you are going to be the guest for episode number 100 of my show Oh, okay. How far yes. away are we? Uh, you'll be seeing <laughs> that today when people are listening to it is about a, a week out. But uh, the reason I do this show is very similar to the way that you do yours is that I, I want to have the actors on the show, but I also want to talk to fan resources like yourself, people who are writers, people who are directors, people who have just used their fandom to make the world a better place or to be creative in ways that they've never been creative before. And I want all those perspectives. So I, we're very, very much in, in line there in what we're doing. So I'm really glad you brought that up. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, I, I, um, it's, I mean, I just have these little pastiches of things over the years. And some of this is like as technology evolved and technology allowed us to different technology allowed the shows, you know, like, Oh, Voyager seven years that there's never a mark on that ship. Well, the, the model costs too much. Well, now we've got CG and we can muck up a ship as much as, mm -hmm. as we want. Look at Discovery, right? Right. So, I mean, like some of those, you know, Gene and his like no space battles. Well, part of that was because he didn't want writers to go crazy writing something that they couldn't produce because mm -hmm. they couldn't afford it. Right. So, you know, the transporter is here because they couldn't afford to land a ship on a planet sequence every week or even have stock footage. So, you know, so the, the transporter opens up a whole new paradigm of storytelling because of a limitation. I mean, go, you know, go back to the beginning, but um, just, just, oh, I don't know, just, just thinking of how like moments in fandom happened or, or this back and forth between fandom and the relationship. And, and again, motion picture happened was something totally new because a fan base 
saved a show, mm -hmm. not just out of sappy sentimentality, but because people like they needed it in their lives. Yes. And the fan fiction happened. You know, the earliest fan films were in the 70s. People were shooting them on eight millimeter, you know, whatever. If you were really ambitious, you had to do that. But people, it was like, no, you gave us this thing. And if you take it away, we're going to make it for ourselves, whether that's, you know, writing or prop and costuming or fan filming or whatever, or just having clubs and conventions where we can keep talking about it because no one wanted to let it go. It's like, you're not taking this away from us. And when they talk about fan ownership of Star Trek, well, it's really a corporate thing that Paramount slash CBS slash Paramount, whatever. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. But again, that you wouldn't be here making your paycheck if it wasn't for this fan base over 50 years. But it's even more than that. It's like people don't want when they Star Trek fans. That's, this is why I love Star Wars. I told if you told me in 78 or 79, what's going to be around in 20 years, much less 50 I would have said, well, Star Trek, hey, there's more of it on camera, you know, back then. But I'm like, what is the there there for Star Wars after the cool of the new, you know, motion control photography and the zip zam zowie space battles? Once that goes away, what's there? And I go, OK, I can see maybe the Jedi philosophy. Maybe it's like a religionish philosophy, kind of like it is for the Vulcans. And maybe that's it. And then they go and do midichlorians and make it something. So I don't know if, you know. It's like if the secret to Star Wars is that they got all these eight year olds and sold them a ton of toys the first five years. And that's what kept I mean, I don't I, and now it's expanded and there's, you know, the comics and books have all expanded it. And until until the Mandalorian, really, and maybe the animated series. But there was I used to say there's only three and then now there's only six and now there's more. But there's like two hour movies of a certain number. And OK, fine. Now it's starting to expand. But for years and years and years, right after Enterprise went down and Star Trek was dead, there were, there were 700, you know, whatever it was, 400 hours, 500 hours of Star Trek of all kinds, way more than any other you know, franchise like that out there. That's a big one. That's, the movie like James Bond and Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings. And I mean, they're, they're like tiny compared to what's on film for Star Trek. And that's why when STO finally came, I'm like, Yes, yeah, Star Trek is a natural for multiplayer online gaming because there's so much there to go do. Anyway, I'm, and, and I'm, I'm convinced. That, I mean, I, I haven't played STO in years, but the reason I wanted it and the reason I will eventually get back to it is that if anybody could just say, hey, there's a virtual world you'd want to live in, a huge chunk of this planet's population is going to say Star Trek. And, yes. and that's the reason is that there is something in that that they say, this is the way I want my world to be. And, and that's true for Star Wars, it's true for MST3K, it's true for James Bond. Everything we get into, we get into because we look at it and say, that's some, there's something in that that I want in my life. Right. And I'm gonna I'm right. gonna find a way to bridge that gap. Well, I I years ago it, it came to me to put it even like back in the rerun days when there were just the original 80 shows, it was like you want the magic of it, and it's what you know, Gene and Gene and Bob Justman and Dorothy and every, you know, all down the line, Matt Jeffries, everybody up and down the line put into it was that you didn't see, you didn't ever get off that ship very often, but there was a world there. Now we call it world building. So we have uh, terms for all these things that we didn't know what they were mm -hmm. because Star Trek was the first thing that grabbed people this way. And now eight or 10 or 12 other things have, and we have words for everything. But, but back then the world building was what grabbed me because you felt like you'd watch three or four cycles of reruns when you were a kid after school for the first time. And you felt like you knew what that world was that. Yeah. So when a tech manual comes out and puts down, you know, postulates other things that weren't in the series, you might argue about a couple of points, but you went, Oh, okay. That makes sense. Because hopefully there was some kind of vetting that went on that the person mm -hmm. writing those books or drawing those diagrams was a fan too. And they're coming out of, you know, they're putting their head cannon on paper on day one or day three or something. And, but you could always, you always felt like you could crawl inside your TV and know exactly what that world was. And if you went somewhere that hadn't been in an episode, you know exactly what to do, you know? And they treated it with respect. And yeah, they made goofs, but they tried to keep everything, you know, the believability factor and the consistency. Because if it hadn't, if it just been another, even if it had been serious shows, but a lost in space type thing where everything just kind of veered over, you know, over and over, 
it wouldn't have had this. That's why I always love that people love to kick the canon folks and the canonistas, but mm. that's that's part of the formula. Otherwise, it would be people getting their aspirational future geek fiction from Star Wars or from Marvel or from whatever. But the thing that makes Star Trek separate is for, for better and for worse, and usually for the better, or it would have imploded. Over 55 years, they have tried to keep the same the same i say canon the same guardrails in place and not rebooted every three years not had 15 different designers with 15 different visions of the universe you know what all, when they do a throwback show like trials and tribulations or relics or flashback they go back and you know make the old footage work or they make the old design work and so. I mean, just just a as that makes just, I know that makes discovery problematic, but we'll well, we'll you know we, what we have twenty years perfect. to work on that, like cling on bumpy heads. We finally sure. got there. <laughs> Took twenty eight years, but we finally got there. Yeah, like I said, nothing is perfect. There's always going to be bumps in the road, but like you said, that the guardrails are there. You're still going to skim around the road a little bit, mm -hmm. but but I mean, I people were arguing over whether Section Thirty One is truly something that fits Gene's vision. I hate that term more than I can tell you but let's just run with it for the moment. Well, um, section 31 has its name from the part of the charter that allows it to exist. Article 14, section 31. Uh -huh. I picked up my copy of the Starfleet technical manual written in the seventies, 20 years before DS9, flipped to article 14. I don't know it word for word, but it basically says when shit goes down, we will do what we got to do okay they made their effort they they dotted their eyes they crossed their trees to make that make sense i respect that and i love section 31 i'm not down on it but it's like when you yeah. can go back to a book 20 years ago that the people watching it may or may not even have and just make it accurate that makes sense that's good writing yeah well and and yeah um i keep forgetting about that part of it because the that was that from ds9 or was that from enterprise that was ds9 Oh, it was okay. Yes, like the first section up later on. Yeah. Okay, from Inquisition or whatever, or or sick Vasem, Vasem, whatever the. No, wait. That's the that's the discovery. The Latin show. That's the other big Section Thirty One show. Yeah, the, I, I know year. that. Yeah. I I don't know the Latin off the top of my head, but yeah. Uh, but that one, yeah, uh, the one where they used uh where they used Voyager as another <laughs> as a sister <laughs> show, um, yeah, uh no no it's it's that way I mean. It's it's also an evolution. In the eighties, you, you the, the fanboys of the original series were the original series people were Bob and Gene Kuhn and I mean you know like they, and the, their legendary memos that they write back and forth to each other. And then Next Gen was all about being different and standing on its own. And you started off with a couple of fan people who I mean Dorothy and, and David Gerald Dorothy Fontana and David Gerald but you know politics took over and it's like the new guard was doing its thing plus the chaos and leonard, uh, leonard majelis gene's lawyer but third season michael pillar's like we got to do something here he's, he's stuck he's coming in to write the ship and settle things down finally after three years uh, and how many other situations that would have even existed or gone on that long it was only star trek that could you know could survive that long but and having a and having its own studio's boss not having a network to answer to which was gene's vision but um uh, also the need for money income <laughs> driving that but i mean michael's like opened up the door to the fan you know the fan submissions even though yeah 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 people will gripe that their ideas have been ripped off because 15 people had the same idea but you know here's a little release form bang let's handle that and that worked for 15 years until it didn't anymore but you know they're so desperate and they're so behind and trying to change the paradigm just a little bit from the way maury hurley had been doing it to make it more family Instead of the, the crisis of the week or the monster or the planet of the week, it's let's emphasize our family as we have those things happening and get back into that more. And that was the magic. And that's what made him stick. But he also knew that he was desperate and he was way behind because he came in like three or four shows behind. He didn't get to plan for the year. And the first half of third season was just like was like Wiley Coyote on the rocket shoes where they're dragging him along and he finally got up you know by mid-season when you see the shit turn around yesterday's enterprise which is an insane show to put together the way it happened but by the time you get that last you get out of the the shows <laughs> and you get to the last half of the season 
you can tell something is starting to happen and magical and then best of both worlds happens and then bang the summer of insane crazy people waiting on the cliffhanger and then you're off to the races but also that third season was when he they they get a script off the slush pile by this young kid who's a waiter living in Narain Shankar's living room Ron Moore and they do the bonding and oh my god it's so good it didn't have to be changed they threw, they changed four words in the whole script and they hire him on staff and that's the first time you had Star Trek circling back around long enough to have had a fanboy come up through as a professional writer and just just, just the, the timeline playing out and then after that real quick you've got brandon you've got renee you've got brian eventually you've got Nira. i mean you have people and event you know you have lisa clink then and and even the people that you know michael wasn't a trek fan and jerry taylor wasn't a trek fan but they were good writers and they knew what to go look at but eventually you had you had ira who had been a you know fanboy you had who was a working writer young coming up so eventually you had legitimate people not just crazy fans pitching stories or out whining or writing crazy fanzine stories or maybe even some really good fanzine stories but you had people who were dedicating their lives to being a writer who just happened to have been a star trek fan. excuse me a fan when they were a kid and and then eventually that kicked into where now you're watching these Oh my God, a year, last fall, I think, the, the first time they rolled out the Strange New World writers on a CBS panel, and all of them, maybe not the showrunner, but the showrunner was very supportive and knew what he was doing, but I think all the writers below the showrunner were all just verklempting over, they were all choking up and tearing up about what how awesome it was to be working on a Star Trek after what it meant to them as a kid. So we've it took a while for that to, you know, it got going finally in the 90s. But to have a generation of Star Trek people, you know, and that's what's happened to Star Wars and, and the other ones where they're looking at long term growth, but they want somebody who's who's got a foot in both worlds. They're a writer, they're they're producer, showrunner, writer, but they're also a fan at heart and they're not having to learn it. And there's nothing against people that learned. But my God, if you're if you if you, it's in your DNA to begin with, <laughs> you know, and why not? Why not get those people to run things? And that's that's you know, look at Mac, Mike McMahon and Lower Decks. That's exactly what that is. So, anyway, sorry, that was a thing. I don't know why it got us off on that, but no, no. And I'm I'm hoping every fan gets that opportunity if they seek it out. If they that those right. chances are there, those those positions are there. The the inspiration is there. Well, you know, it used to. This is part of the geek revolution in media. It used to like on Star Trek. If you were a fan and you were working anywhere in the crew, the staff, or whatever and you weren't hired to be that way, it was like you were suspicious because you're the one probably leaking, you know, to the fan press. And you're the one probably selling those, you know, your sketches or you'd find stuff in the trash and you're selling it to the scummy fan press, you know? And I mean, we've gone full circle from that attitude to, you know, who's leaking scripts to, uh, oh my God, we're desperate for people to run the front. We need people who get it. I mean, it's amazing, but that's part of the geek revolution. You know what I'm saying? It's like now that's a value and just people that are open to people with an imagination rather than let's just get the trains to run. I mean, having the trains run on time is, is a good important. thing. Yeah. Yeah. But now that they wait a year between seasons, like that's not even it's still a cruncher thing. But it's like, yeah, it's almost like the world has adapted to telling, you know, genre and Star Trek stories. I, I don't know. Anyway, but what, what you were saying there a minute ago was just got me thinking about how how we've caught up to where it the world is now benefiting and is able to take advantage of and thanks to the geek generation where you don't have to stay in the closet you can come out and let your geek flag fly as they say you know all that whole that whole thing is like just a non sequitur now so people can just go for it and now they're in demand now we're staffing up shows and and thanks to everything being 24 7 and all the channels people are 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 media savvy and geek savvy the way they weren't 20 years ago now everybody you know five-year-old kids know what pitch season is <laughs> pilot season is you know and oh it's we're, we're it's staffing season mm -hmm. i mean it's like the hollywood seasons are now on everybody's calendar people people know what that is and more people are coming from across the country not just being born in la to write which is awesome too or people are doing it remotely or people are doing their craft remotely you know i mean pandemics push that along but anyway that's a whole other topic i could get into it's just that the advantages and and the opportunities we have now to work 
wherever you are on whatever you want, as long as you're willing to maybe make the right connections, talk to the right people mm -hmm. and work your ass off is not a small point to make. Somebody made the very big, you know, they always say, oh, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Well, it's both. Yeah. And sometimes who you know can be accomplished by what you know. But somebody said, you know, you can do all you can to get your foot in the door. But once you're in the room, you still got to have something. Mm -hmm. You still got to show people something, whether it's writing or it's artwork or it's CG or it's, you know, whatever. You still got to show something once you get in there. So, yeah, it's a two part process. And you should worry about the core before you ever, because the worst thing in the world is to be given the chance to pitch or show or demo and you're not up to snuff. And then it's like, oh, yeah. And, you know, maybe four people were in the room then, but maybe the, you know, not like you bombed <laughs> or you insulted somebody or you set the room on fire the wrong way. But, you know, it's just like you don't you, you don't always get good second and third chances. So, you know, try to try to do what you can for your first chance. And then, but yeah, if it doesn't happen, you'll try, try again. But know it in the conviction and the confidence that you've 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 got good stuff to show off. And if you're not quite there yet. Sure, go for it. And maybe sometimes when you're there and you're not quite there, you get some great advice. Hopefully, it's a it's a it's a good supportive place where they'll throw you advice, which is what you know. Like, it depending on where people were, sometimes those script rejected scripts that came in, maybe not from Michael but from somebody else on staff, people might get a two or three paragraph letter, you know, or two or three sentences. And a lot of those young writers, oh, that was gold. I know people that have got their rejection letters framed. And sometimes there are people that went on, you know, to, to, to write professionally or do something else in entertainment professionally. And they save those because their goal. I mean, it's hard at the moment. It's all hard being told no, but sometimes that's just part of the learning curve, you know? That's good advice. Really good advice. And I probably, if I want to be sensible, I should probably leave it there. Yeah. Larry, thank you so much for doing this. I don't want to hold you for the rest of the day, but I want to make sure people can follow you. I'm going to link to your website. I'm going to link to your Twitter. Is there anything else I can send people to? Uh, I'm, I'm way behind on getting people on my YouTube. So and now we put up two live shows a week. Uh, Trekline Tuesdays Live is there. I mean, come watch us live, but it's also back up on 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 archiving. And uh, and then Life Support Live that I do with Dr. Ali Matu on Saturdays, where we we mash up Star Trek and mental health, you know, just daily living. And uh, we say we, we are to boldly go through uncertain times is our mission. And we have a lot of fun. We have a lot and we have good communities on both of those. There's live chat on both of those. And then I have my podcast with Roddenberry, the Trek files, which I love doing. And it's a short, as opposed to the, like the way I talk today, <laughs> those are like 15 minute little nuggets every week. So 15, 20 minutes. So they're great, but yeah, everything portal 47, if you want a really deep dive and get in the program. And um, when this damn pandemic is over, I'm looking forward to ramping up Trekland treks again, which is the day tours you can do, but you can get to all that at, at my site. And, and we're doing a geek nation tour, big tour next year for the first time in five years, which is, my friend Terrace Cassidy's company, and we do four or five days of Star Trek film sites. And with the official con shifting from Vegas to Chicago, we're going to do it the week before that and then pick up and, and then have some events in Chicago, mainly gangster related because there's no Chicago connection in Star right. Trek. But we got the Ioceans, thank God. Other than that, there's not really a Chicago connection. But um, anyway, but yeah, a lot of stuff. A lot of, oh, and I just opened a store at T Public with. Uh, you know, cool things. There's a life support live mug and shirts and the whole, you know, there's, there's, you know, stuff, but a lot of fun stuff. And a lot, some of our, our tribe got really excited about the tote bag and, <laughs> and stuff. So anyway, but thanks for Aaron. Thanks for asking me to come on and, and just thank talk. you for being here. I've been looking forward fun to this stuff. so much. I, I'll be honest with you. I would have asked you on a long time ago, but for the fact that I really wanted to do this face to face and you know, the world is what it is right now. Mm -hmm. So I said for episode 100, we are just going to bite the bullet and do it on Zoom. Okay. So wait, so this is episode 100? Yes. Oh, oh, I thought you were in the future. Oh, well, wow. Okay. Well, since I missed episode 47. <laughs> Sorry about that. This is the next best thing. No, this is great. Thank you. That's very cool. Okay. Thank you so much. And I hope to have you back soon. Oh, great, great, great. Trek well, Aaron. You as well.